So hi everyone, my name is Jonathan Davis. I work for the uh, um, work for Citrix, and uh, my job is performance of Zen Server. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, keeping up with the hardware. So para virtualized I/O performance. How are we doing? What do we still have to do? So uh, let's give uh, focus to this. Um, so I'm going to start by briefly talking about the challenge that we face with, with power virtualized I.O. performance. And then the bulk of the talk, I'll be talking about networking and then storage performance. And in both of those cases, I'll be, talk, I'll be giving some measurements, where do we stand now, and uh, talking about some stuff that's happened recently, performance-wise, and what are we going to do in the future to get to where we need to be. Um, I think I've got a lot of material here that I'd like to show you, so I think it's probably best if we try and keep questions to the end, if that's OK. Um, so let's get going without further ado. So what is the challenge? Well, this is, this is my take on, on the challenge that we face. IO devices are getting exponentially quicker, so it's a log scale on the vertical axis. So NICs have been increasing in speed exponentially over many, many years and look set to continue to do so. Disks have been recently getting quicker um, with new technologies like um, NVMe, uh, non-volatile memory. On the other hand, the red line shows that CPUs have leveled off. So Moore's law no longer applies. And now um, CPU clock frequencies are, are staying the same. So the challenge, therefore, is that uh, our I.O. devices are getting quicker, but our CPUs are staying the same. So that means that our relative virtualization <laughs> overhead is increasing. So on, on old hardware, if we spent a lot of time in the device, then a little bit of CPU overhead doing the virtualization stuff uh, maybe only added uh, a few, few percent overhead. But now, if our devices are really, really quick, perhaps all, several orders of magnitude quicker than they were a few years ago, suddenly the same amount of overhead really dominates. And now it can be thousands of percent or, or hundreds of percent overhead. And that's bad. So let's get straight on with it and see how that, um, how that plays out in the space of networking, first of all. So there's various different ways in which we can talk about networking performance. Uh, are we talking about VMs on the same host, communicating with VMs on different hosts? Are we talking about one VM or many VMs? There's various different categories. I've got five here. And I'm, I'm generalizing a bit, and I'm being, uh, being a little bit provocative in, in saying whether Zen performs well or badly. I know there's lots of other factors involved, but humor me. Uh, this is my, my little judgment of Zen's performance. And I'm going to talk about uh, the first two of these today. I don't have time to talk about the rest. Um, and naturally, I'm going to focus on the, the, the bad bits. So if this all seems like doom and gloom, remember there are some good bits as well. Uh, but I, 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 I'm not going to talk about them. So I'm going to spend most of my time here talking about the first of those, intra host VM to VM. So I've got two VMs talking to each other on the same host. And then I'll spend a little bit of time later on talking about aggregate throughput. So if you're doing a single TCP stream between two VMs on the same host, I've got um, some measurements here showing a pair of CentOS 7 VMs on some reasonably modern hardware. And we get 15 gigabits per second between them. Well, not bad. But um, where I think we should be, um, uh, on, this, on this kind of hardware is about double that. So we've got some work to do. But it's even worse than that, because if I upgrade my CentOS 7 guests uh, and put a 4.0 kernel in both of them, <laughs> I've got a regression. And we only get 9 gigabits per second between these VMs. So um, things are getting worse. The world is against us. Um, the, uh, the evolution of the Linux kernel has caused this, this problem. So how do we go about understanding where the bottlenecks are? Why is it that we are behind where we should be by, in this, in this case, uh, a factor of two or three times? Well, the way I like to uh, try and answer that question, where do the bottlenecks lie, is by drawing pictures like this. Now, um, what I've done is I have instrumented the entire data path from end to end between these two guests. So I've, um, I've looked at the whole data path. I've put in various trace points along the data path. And each time that a network packet 
goes past one of those trace points, I record the time at which that, that event happened. And this graph um, has time going upwards, and each of the colored lines represents a single packet. So you can see, um, uh, by looking at this kind of graph, the, the times at which it went through each of those checkpoints. Now, I know that the font's probably too small for you to read um, the details of um, what's actually happening on each of those stages, but just very broadly, so you get the idea. Um, we're going from the transmitting guest on the, on the far left in the red area, and then it goes into netback through a bridge or perhaps an OVS, um, into the receiving netback device. We've then got a bit of dialog, and uh, we then go into our other DOM U, and then the guest kernel there receives the packet. So that's roughly um, um, what this kind of diagram shows, and I'm going to be showing you several diagrams like this. So. Hopefully that, that makes sense. And this, this is just a snapshot. I'm using iPerf here to generate my traffic between the two VMs. And this is just a, a short snapshot of a few packets while sustaining um, whatever the throughput was, nine, nine gigabits per second. So this is uh, with a 4.x kernel. So what is the problem here? Well, the problem is that there's too, much, too many gaps in this diagram, uh, because gaps mean no packets in flight. So uh, I've highlighted here in, in red the periods when NetFront is not doing anything. So NetFront is idle for, all, for that vertical section uh, where you see red. And almost all of that vertical column, as you can see, is red. And that basically means that NetFront is completely idle. And that's because we've got a problem upstream. NetFront just isn't, isn't being sent packets from the guest kernel quickly enough. And the reason for that is that in this uh, 4.0 kernel, it's particularly aggressive in limiting the number of packets um, that, uh, that can be in flight to the device. So um, this is the, um, for those who are familiar with the guest kernel, it's, um, it's the WMEM um, allocation. And uh, typically, that's something like 128 kilobytes. So if I'm dealing with 64K packets here, you can actually see that for most of the, most of the diagram here, there's only two packets in flight. And that's what the guest kernel is limiting us to here. So any optimizations we do in netback or anything like that, um, if we're only getting two packets in flight, then that's going to that's going to keep our throughput pretty low. So the problem we have is that TX completion latency is too high. So the assumption in the guest kernel is that it's going to be quite a quick thing when I've got an SKB to give it to my, my NIC driver and for it to say, yep, I've sent the packet. And hence, um, 128K isn't actually that much of a restriction when your latency is low. But in our case, um, TX completion latency is very high because that is measured as the gap between when the guest kernel puts the request in the TX ring and then all the way down the line when the response is received, the, the TX response is received in the TX ring um, that's put there by NetBack. So just going back to the graph, I've highlighted in yellow there the point at which that TX response is sent back to the guest. And so it's the, the time delay between um, the bit on the left and the bit on the right that determines that, uh, that TX completion latency. And that's just too high at the moment. And that's what's causing the whole pipeline to stall um, because we, we simply, um, we simply hidden this bottleneck too quickly. So what can we do about this? Well, naturally, we could try to do things to reduce the latency. So can we, can we do things to, um, to make that happen earlier? You know, do everything in DOM0, in, in NetBack, much quicker. Well, yeah, but that sounds like a lot of work to me. So can we, um, can we do a workaround for now to try to make things flow a little better? And one idea I have is that we could, um, uh, we could pretend that TX completion happens earlier than it actually does. We could do this using uh, a function called SKB orphan, which is a way of decoupling the, uh, the packet um, from, um, from the memory accounting. So it means that uh, this WMEM alloc um, limitation, we, we, can, we can basically bypass that and, <clears throat> and pretend that the SKB is, has um, been completed before it actually has. So it's a way of getting a bit more data into our pipeline. And this actually, I think this makes some sense because with a physical NIC driver, we, the TX completion happens 
when, when the NIC driver has put the, um, put the request onto the physical card. It doesn't, it doesn't signal completion when it's gone onto the card and then gone through the switch and then gone into the receiving queue of wherever it's being sent next. And that's, that's what we're doing in NetBack. We're, we're, we're only signaling the TX response once it's, got, once it's been put into the receiving device. So perhaps it makes sense to signal completion earlier. So I haven't had a chance to try this out, but I think um, I'd like to uh, try prototyping this up and see whether I can get a bit more data flowing into the pipeline using SKB Orphan. So what will, what will the data path look like after we've got a bit more data in the pipe? Well, I can, um, I can imagine what that might look like because I can wind my guest kernel, my DOMU kernel back to 3.18, which is just before it started getting super aggressive in terms of limiting the amount of data in flight to the NIC. Um, and here you see that the graph looks quite different. So now we've got more packets in flight, um, but unfortunately we're still, we're still hitting the TX completion latency problem. So this is still the limiting factor here. We've still got big periods which NetFront is not transmitting anything. We've got a little difference. The eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that uh, there's a different shape of the graph here, and that's just because the decision about where the, um, the WMEM um, limitation happens is, is done a bit later in this earlier kernel. Um, nevertheless, we can still learn quite a bit about um, other bottlenecks from this graph because if I now highlight in red the periods when the nappy thread of execution is not running, we see something interesting. So, so just, just for those who may not know, um, the, the, the transmit work done by NetBack is handled, in, um, handled by uh, nappy, which is run in soft IQ context. And you can see here that actually there aren't many you know, the, the, the amount of red boxes on that diagram isn't much. And that means that my nappy thread is running almost flat out. It's almost using 100% of a DOM0 vCPU. So this suggests to me that even if we made the TX completion latency much shorter than it is now, we would only get a small improvement in throughput because we'd soon hit this next bottleneck, which is nappy maxing out a DOM0 vCPU. So, We've got two problems to fix. What can we do about, um, about this? Can we, can we do anything to improve the efficiency of NAPI? <coughs> well, I've got two ideas. Um, one is to avoid spilling over into a frag list by copying more. So that's a bit cryptic. Let me, let me try to briefly explain that without going into too much detail. Um, one of, there's a slow path that we're hitting for almost 30% of the packets um, in the measurements I was doing, so I recorded uh, the 30% of the packets are hitting this slow path, uh, which is to use a frag list. And um, for the purpose of, of this, let me just say that that means that things are slower in NetPack. The way we handle this packet uh, is, is slower. And um, the reason that we spill over into that is because uh, we failed to copy enough of it. So the way that NetPack works is that it, it copies that, it tries to copy a bit of the header and then maps the rest of the packet. Uh, this is generally good for performance because mapping is, is a whole lot better than copying the whole thing. Um, but failing to copy enough um, means that we sometimes spill over into a frag list. So perhaps if we copied more, we could avoid that slow path. However, copying more will, will be slower than copying less because you know, copying is, um, is inherently slow. Second idea is to unbatch the grant map. So if I go back to the previous graph, you will notice that um, there's this, there are these bits here where um, several packets that are, that are all going through um, at roughly the same time are batched. And that's when we do the grant map operation. Um, so historically, it's always been a good thing to batch these operations because there have been costs associated with doing the, doing the, the, the map, grant map hypercall. However, there's been a lot of recent improvements to the efficiency of the grant map hypercall, particularly around locking. And that means it's no longer so expensive. So perhaps now is the time to think about unbatching that. To think, will things get better? Well, I have prototyped up these two things. And this is what it looks like. So you'll see now that the whole shape of the graph looks a bit cleaner. It's easier to see the flow 
Um, we've still got a really messy bit that I, I won't talk about now in terms of deallocation. Uh, that, that's another, another can of worms. Um, but it's a lot cleaner. The end-to-end -end latency of the connection is now, um, is now a bit more predictable because we've got rid of that batching. But the periods of red that I've marked there just as before, when, when Nappy is not doing anything, um, unfortunately, we haven't really made too much more red appear on this diagram. <coughs> So actually, um, whilst these things seem to me uh, to be good ideas to improve the efficiency of, of this thread of execution, uh, they haven't really done much. So uh, still back to the drawing board on this one, I think. So yeah, further work is required to increase the efficiency of, of the nappy thread. <coughs> OK, let me briefly talk about aggregate uh, throughput. So I'm still talking about a single host. Um, lots of VMs communicating with each other on a single host. Some measurements. We're about a factor of three behind where I think we need to be on this hardware. This is, this is fairly, fairly modern hardware. <coughs> and why is that? Well, aggregate throughput is typically limited by DOM0 CPU utilization. So you're, you're doing a lot of work, all your net back threads are doing a lot of work, and you're really limited by how much work DOM0 is allowing you to do in terms of CPU utilization. And um, there are two things that we could do to improve this. One is to improve grant map scalability, uh, to try and make that um, more efficient, and particularly make it more efficient when you have more DOM0 vCPUs. So giving DOM0 more CPU power will mean it can do more work. If, you're, if it's a CPU bound activity. So these two things work well together. Um, uh, and just to say that there are already, there have been several improvements in grant map scalability that have gone into Zen 4.6, um, contributed by uh, Amazon and Citrix. And there's a third one on its way um, by, by Malcolm Crossley uh, to avoid the TLB flush on OnMap that um, I believe he's in the process of, of upstreaming. So how does this work out in terms of measurements? <clears throat> well, before these improvements, the red line, it was pretty disastrous. So on my x-axis here, the horizontal axis, if you added more vCPUs, the total throughput you got went down by perhaps as much as 50%. But, you know, it's completely crazy. So we were completely stuck before these improvements. We couldn't do anything about giving DOM0 more horsepower but now we can, because you can see with the green line that after these improvements, things scale much, much better. It's linear up to, up to you know, 10, 15 CPUs. It's, it's very much better. And we don't get this, this drop off. So we can now throw as many vCPUs as you like to DOM0, and it, it, should, it should improve the performance. So this is great. And you can see that the total I'm getting here is about 80 gigabits per second, which brings us much closer to the target that I set a few slides ago. So before we move on to storage performance, just to summarize where we stand for networking, we've got these two bottlenecks. Uh, we need to fix them in this order. Firstly, the TX completion latency. We need to, uh, need to reduce that. And one thing I think we can do as a kind of workaround is using SKB Orphan to pretend that TX completion happens earlier. Once we've done that, we'll need to improve the efficiency of NAPI. Um, and I think I, I've, I've put that in red there because I think there's still a big question mark over what we can do there because uh, the ideas that I had didn't really show big improvements there. Uh, so there's still some more work to be done there. And in aggregate throughput, things are good. These have already been improved in Zen 4.6. There's more improvements to come, and I'm, I'm fairly happy with that now. So let's move on to storage performance. So now... Again, this is a gross generalization, and this is my, my opinion only. I think that um, Zen is pretty weak when it comes to the performance of a single virtual block device, VVD. Um, it's pretty good with aggregate throughput, so um, let's just focus on the negatives, <coughs> and let's consider here um, some measurements of um, serial, uh, so not, not parallel I.O., of block size 4K, and we're about half where, we, where I think we should be. On, on the kind of hardware that I was measuring that on. So why is single block device throughput worse than it should be? Well, there are three reasons. 
that, I, that I've identified. Uh, one is that latency is too high. Secondly, we can't get enough data in flight. And thirdly, um, the back-end CPU utilization can, can be too high and can sometimes um, max out a vCPU. I'll talk um, primarily about the first two of them, um, given the time I've got available now. So firstly, um, latency is too high, so how can we reduce the latency? <coughs> so latency, high latency is going to particularly impact sequential um, uh, or serial I.O., so when you've got I.O. depth 1, um, and it's going to particularly affect small block sizes, uh, because that's when the virtualization overhead will become most apparent. So a bit of background for those who aren't familiar with Zen Server. We use Tapdisk 3, which is a user space backend, and it uses grant copy using this, this grant device, Gunt Dev. And I have two ideas for how we can reduce the latency. One is we can use polling in the back end. So polling is an established technique. It's, uh, it's already used in the networking subsystem. And it's all about um, checking the ring repeatedly. So looking at the ring, is there a new request? Is there a new request? Is there a new request? Keep on looking, and um, if there is, it means that we can pick it up instantly. We don't have to wait for the front end to put a request in the ring and then notify us through the event channel, wait for DOM0 to receive that interrupt, and then wait for DOM0 scheduler to schedule the, the relevant process and then pick it up. That, you know, there's a lot of latency there. So, um, so polling uh, looks like it could help. That's one idea. Second idea is... Um, can we use grant map? So I said that Tapdisk 3 uses grant copy. Surely grant map is quicker. Um, in principle, uh, I think grant map should always be, always be quicker than grant copy. So we'll see. So firstly, some measurements on polling. So um, without polling, this is sequential I.O. Um, <clears throat> I'm showing here various block sizes. And um, you can see that with polling, we sometimes get as much as double the throughput. So this really shows that we're being highly impacted by that, the latency of the event channel and the wake-up latency here. And simply polling, uh, in this case, I'm polling for, uh, for one millisecond after the previous request was received. So I'm just constantly checking and spinning on the ring, uh, checking to see whether there's any more data. And... Um, this shows a promising improvement, so that's good. What about, um, oh, oh yeah, so, so just to say, um, it seems like also the bigger, the faster the disk, the bigger the improvement, because again, your, your relative virtualization overhead will be biggest when your disk is quickest. So uh, the quicker the disk, the better polling will behave until, as the footnote suggests there, until you hit that CPU utilization bottleneck, but we won't go into that now. So Zen Server is likely to adopt polling in Tapdisk 3 because uh, it looks, looks good. Uh, one note, though, is that we need to be careful about eating too much CPU in DOM0. So naturally, polling is going to be CPU intensive. So um, the approach that we're taking in Zen Server is going to be something along the lines of only polling if, if it looks like there's sufficient CPU capacity in DOM0. And uh, if there is, then great, go ahead, go and, go and spin your CPUs looking at this ring. So idea two, uh, what about grant map? How does that compare to grant copy? Well, this, this was slightly surprising for me. Again, this is um, sequential IO, Q depth one, looking at different block sizes. The red line is, is the baseline, that's grant copy, and the green line is grant map. So it's actually worse. Why is that? Across all block sizes. Well, good question. If someone, if someone knows the answer, let me know. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 my, my best guess is it looks like there's an inefficiency with the, the grant device uh, because I think in, in principle and other, you know, and, and um, experiments from other things have shown that grant map is, you know, is always going to be faster than grant copy and that's why we're using it in the networking subsystem. Uh, so I think um, it looks like we need to do some work on the grant device and we need to look into what the inefficiencies are there and hopefully fix them. So there's work to be done. So, that was about reducing latency. What about getting more data in flight? Well, how much data do we have in flight at the moment? <clears throat> so each, um, each ring for a virtual block device currently has 32 slots. 
and each slot can address up to 44K of data. So that's a total of just less than 1.4 megabytes, which is about this much. Who, who remembers these? So this, this is what it looks like if 1.4 megabytes is in flight. <laughs> so that's not much. <laughs> so, um, and you know, modern, modern disks, modern arrays, uh, they can give much better throughput when issued with more data than that. You know, more, more than I can throw at this array. They'll, 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 they'll happily, happily accept more. So how can we get more data in flight? Well, here are three ideas, and these are, these are well-known, well-established ideas that have been floating around for, for years. Multi-queue, uh, can, uh, can we have multiple rings <coughs> per block device? Or multi-page ring, can we have a bigger ring per block device? Or indirect descriptors, can we address more data per ring slot? So these are all ways of getting more data in flight. Um, and for the first two of them, there are patches currently being discussed on Zendevel, and the third one's been in the kernel for, for quite some time now. So let's look at some measurements. So firstly, multi-queue. <coughs> this is using the patches that Bob, uh, Bob Liu from Oracle uh, has been proposing. And look at that, that's, that's great. Um, so particularly for small block sizes, I, I'm, I'm measuring here sequential I.O. with eight threads and quite a high queue depth. So the idea here is that I'm trying to make sure that the use case that would normally fill a, fill a single ring can now make use of more rings. And you can see here that it does. So I gave it eight, eight, eight queues and I got, uh, I got a big improvement. So that's great, let's ship it until we take out those patches and we get the blue line. So, we, so the blue line shows the performance that we get when um, there are no uh, multi-queue patches in block front. So this is extremely surprising. Uh, you can see there that for small block sizes, it's actually quicker to not have any multi-queue support in the front end at all, even compared to having multi-queue support but with one queue. So clearly we're using a, a different data path. There's something very different about the characteristics of, of how this workload is handled. And this is, this is, this is worrying. And um, there's currently a, a discussion thread right now on Zendevel about this, and about why that's happening. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we haven't yet converged on, a, on a, a good explanation for that in time for me to reveal all the answers in this talk. So the explanation is pending, but one of the observations is that um, I was doing sequential I.O. here, so naturally what would normally happen is that with sequential I.O., guest merges adjacent requests into, into bigger requests. And what's clearly happening is that when we have the multi-queue patches enabled in the front end, there's no merging happening. You, you can clearly see that with tools like I.O. stat. And we do rely on merging to get good performance on modern disks for sequential I.O. So for now, um, I'm reluctant to adopt multi-queue in Zen server uh, because it, it really, really hurts sequential I.O. performance. So with random, the question was about what happened with random performance, um, it, it's better, having, having more queues is better. So as you would expect, because there's no merging happening there. So this weird effect that's happening with request merging is irrelevant because that's just not gonna happen with random I.O. Okay. The second idea was multi-page ring. So again, I've applied uh, the patches. Um, here I've got, uh, I'm doing random I.O. first of all. Um, Q depth four and up to eight, this time I've got threads on, on my x-axis. So um, up to eight threads, that's exactly filling a single ring, 32, um, 32 requests in flight. Uh, and that's where both things um, are the same, but then when I have more than that, then having a bigger ring performs better. So this is an example of where um, multi-page ring is great for random I.O. However, there is some bad news. So uh, look at this graph and then look at it again because it's not what you think. Because here, the green line is the one-page ring and, eight, uh, uh, and the red line is the eight-page ring. So surely the eight-page ring is going to be better, right? It's bigger. Bigger is better. But that's not the case. And again, we've got an issue here with merging. So again, for some reason that um, 
I haven't, I haven't been able to understand. The guest kernel does not merge requests when there's a bigger ring. Well, answers in the post. Oh, we have an answer. Why is it that? <laughs> Um, how many CPUs did I assign to get? I don't remember offhand. Uh, <clears throat> I think I, I think I had eight, 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 eight CPUs on the guest. Um, enough that it wasn't a bottleneck. So the QDEPS is 32 for all block sizes. Okay. Okay. Well, let, let, let's talk afterwards. Um, <clears throat> there's something I don't understand there, um, but I think there's, there's still more work to be done before. Um, I'm happy that, that sequential I/O won't be hurt when adopting the multi-page ring. Thirdly, we had indirect descriptors, indirect I/O. This is an interesting one. So this. Um, this allows us to ha address one megabyte per ring slot rather than just 44K, so we can get a lot more in flight. Don't worry, I'm not about to throw 32 floppy disks off the room. Uh, but uh, we can get a lot, more, a lot more data in flight, but is this a good thing? Well, modern disks respond better to smaller requests. I've got some measurements here, which I think are, are quite interesting. So this is a, a, fairly, a fairly modern SSD, but actually it's representative of, of a fairly wide range of disks that I've measured. <clears throat> this shows uh, the performance that you get when you, you have, a, have data of a certain size and you split them up into smaller chunks and then submit them in parallel. So for example, if you look at this blue line, that's when I've got a megabyte of data. And if you send that one megabyte intact, I get, what, just less than one gigabit per second, gigabyte per second. But if I split it um, several times and then submit those requests in parallel, I can get you know, a good 50% improvement on my throughput there. And actually, if you look at this graph, if you were to try and choose an optimal block size that, that works best uh, across different amounts of data, 44K is a pretty good choice. <laughs> So having 44K as the size of a ring slot, or the amount of data that can be addressed by a ring slot, actually works very well in our favor on, on modern disks. And actually, with indirect I.O., if you allow bigger requests to go through the system, you then end up having worse performance, because you end up then um, being on the, uh, on the kind of right-hand tails of these graphs, where the performance is lower. So allowing bigger requests through can hurt performance. So you know, we, we need to get more data in flight. So the principle of indirect I.O. is good. We've got a problem, though, in that uh, the DOM0 kernel doesn't know the best way of, whether sp of splitting or merging requests. So ideally, I think in the future, um, we want the Linux block layer to know about the optimal block size for the physical disk and then split or merge accordingly. And then we don't have to worry about this. You know, it's just a complete coincidence that we happen to be, be throwing requests down the system at, at what seems to be an optimal block size for modern disks. Uh, you know, that, I don't want to have to rely on this. Uh, it's just, just a complete coincidence. Um, but you know, ideally, we want to um, be able to take advantage of things like indirect I.O. in the future. So just to wrap up, um, to summarize where we stand, on storage performance. So re to reduce latency, polling looks good. Um, as long as you're careful, it, it, it can produce some excellent improvements. Um, grant map still seems like it's not the right thing to use when you're using a user space backend. Uh, grant copy still seems superior. In terms of allowing more data in flight, while well, each of those three ideas that I've discussed have got some issues to do with the sizes of requests, either um, they're preventing merging of, of small requests, and that particularly hurts sequential I.O. Or in the case of indirect I.O., it's allowing requests that are too big to go through, and that's hurting your performance. So there's some future work to do there in terms of improving the grant device and getting some better strategy for getting more data in flight without, without these regressions uh, that we saw. So I'm sorry that was uh, rather rushed, and I've, I've glossed over a lot of things. Um, are there any questions?
Yes. On-demand polling. Like the Linux network stack has a, has a similar mechanism where they look, like, because polling is intensive, they look at the amount of packets uh, in flight and then switch on the polling when it's, it's useful. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that some kind of adaptive polling mechanism would, would be uh, the, the right thing. Yeah, we want to try and have, we want to avoid this, we've got a trade-off yeah. of uh, wanting to be responsive but not eat too much CPU. So yeah, I'm sure that kind of thing would, would work well. At the moment, we're adopting quite a naive technique, but it, 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 it works. Yeah. Yep. Ah, uh, yeah. The question was, why do sometimes my lines go down in my, in my networking graphs? I meant to, meant to warn you about that because it can look quite disturbing. Uh, and that's simply because it's, hard to represent parallelism on my 2D graphs. Uh, so there are some, some things that happen in parallel. For example, the deallocation uh, that happens in, um, in NetBack uh, will be happening in parallel with the receiving guest um, starting to process the packets. So hence, we get a bit of, a bit of up and down. Question? Yeah, uh, so the question is about elaborating on the requirements to know about the ideal block size. So I think, I think this graph is, um, is, is worth studying. Um, so as I said, I've measured, I've measured other SSDs and other fast disks, and also um, measured some SANs um, using NFS and iSCSI and that kind of thing. And in general, um, we get this kind of shape um, where for a kind of intermediate block size, issuing requests in parallel at that block size gives us better throughput than either very small requests, as, as you see on here, or very large requests, as you see on the right-hand end. This wasn't the case with traditional mechanical disks, where um, the graph would, would kind of um, uh, go down like that, where um, small block sizes um, Oh, sorry, other way around, I'm, I'm thinking of the inverse graph, um, where the, the, la the, larger, the larger the block size, the better. So it was always best with mechanical disks to, to try and give, give a, a big block size if you're doing sequential I.O. Um, so I don't know if I, I'm, I'm answering your question. Yeah, yeah. So I'm imagining, you know, this is, we're talking about, about future stuff here, but I, I'm imagining that there should be some way for a disk driver to register with the block layer and say, my ideal block size or my ideal um, amount of um, request in parallel is X. Um, and then the kernel would use that information. So the kernel already has the block layer already has facilities for doing both merging and splitting of requests, but it just doesn't know how to do that intelligently. So if instead it knew, it had a, no, a notion of what it was aiming for, for the disk that it's talking to, then perhaps, um, perhaps it could then do that merging or splitting so it could be issuing the disks with, with its favorite block size. It has a notion of maximum support. Um, it has a notion of maximum Max, max sectors KB or something like that. Yeah, but that's different from the optimal block size. Um, the answer is I don't know what parameters contribute to this. So I, I, I'm, I'm not a disk manufacturer. Um, I haven't spoken to any. Uh, this, this is just stuff that I've, I've observed by treating the disk as a black box. Um, and I, I'm just talking speculatively here about how we might tackle this issue. But I think, I feel like this is a, a new thing. I think a lot, of, a lot of the block layer is still oriented around the thinking that it's a mechanical disk. And so I think there's, there's probably a bit, of, uh, a bit of innovation needed from the people down at LinuxCon to, to help fix this, I think. Okay, we're running out of time, so if there's any other questions, please come and find me afterwards. Thank
Thank you, everyone.